In the last video, we talked about what design patterns are and the three main types, creational, structural, and behavioral. And we took a deep dive into one of the most well-known, the singleton pattern. It was all about having one instance and one global access point, useful for things like logging, configuration, or thread pools. But singleton is just one piece of the puzzle. In this video, I want to walk you through three of the most popular and practical design patterns that you will actually use in real world projects. And these are also my personal favorites. Patterns I have used in production systems, interviews, and frameworks like Spring, React, and even game engines. We'll cover factory method, observer, and strategy. For each pattern, I'll explain what problem it solves, how it works, when to use it, and we'll look at a clean Java example along with a simple diagram. Let's jump right in with the factory method pattern. Let's say you need to create objects, but you don't want to hard code which class to instantiate. Why? Because maybe the type depends on user input, configuration, or business rules. Hard coding logic like if type equal to A, new of class A, spreads across your app and becomes a maintenance nightmare. The factory method pattern solves this by pushing object creation into subclasses. So your main code doesn't need to know which class to instantiate. In this diagram here, you have a product interface. This defines what your objects can do. Concrete product implements that interface. It's the actual object you want to create. Then you have a creator class that defines a method called factory method. But it doesn't implement it. It leaves that to its subclass. Concrete creator implements factory method and returns a concrete product. So instead of using new directly in your logic, you can call factory method and let the subclass decide what to return. Here, we start with a simple product interface and a concrete class, concrete product that implements it. Next, we have an abstract creator class. It declares the factory method, but leaves the implementation to its subclass. Now comes in concrete creator, which implements factory method and returns a concrete product. Finally, in the main method, we use the abstract creator reference to trigger the behavior without ever directly creating a concrete product. So what's the benefit of that? It's all about flexibility. You can now easily swap out concrete creator with another subclass like premium creator, mock creator, or even one chosen dynamically from a config file without even touching the rest of your logic. And this kind of flexibility is exactly what makes design patterns so powerful in real world applications. For example, in spring, you have probably seen how beans are injected using interfaces. That's the factory method in action behind the scenes. Spring doesn't hard code class names. It lets you configure with implementation to inject, keeping your code decoupled and testable. Now let's say you have one object, maybe a data source or a system component, and multiple other parts of your app need to react when that object changes. The naive way, you call each of them directly one by one but that quickly becomes tightly coupled, hard to manage, and impossible to scale. The observer pattern solves this by letting one object, called the subject, notify many dependent objects, also called observers, whenever it changes. And you don't need to know how many observers there are, or what they do, you just notify and they react. This pattern is the backbone of event-driven systems, UI frameworks, and real-time applications. Here, you have a subject interface that defines three core methods, attach, detach, and notify. The concrete subject holds the actual state and a list of observers. On the other side, you have an observer interface with an update method. Concrete observer implements that and reacts when the subject changes. The flow is simple. Observers register themselves to the subject using attach. When the subject state changes, it calls notify and that triggers update on all registered observers. The subject doesn't care what the observers do, it just broadcasts that change. And here is an example code. Here, we start with an observer interface that defines an update method. Then, we create a concrete observer, in this case, an email subscriber, that prints the message when notified. Next is the subject interface, which defines methods to manage observers, such as attach, detach, and notify observers. New publisher is our concrete subject. It holds list of observers and notifies all of them when there is new content. And finally, in the main method, 
we create the subject, attach observers, and simulate a state change by calling notify observers. Each subscriber receives the update without the publisher needing to know who they are or how they handle it. You can actually think of the observer pattern like a YouTube channel. The channel is the subject. Viewers subscribe by calling attach and when a new video is published, the channel calls notify and all the subscribers get notified. That's exactly how event listeners works on UI, how message brokers notify services and how real-time dashboards update in systems like Grafana or Firebase. Now, sometimes your applications needs to support multiple algorithms or behaviors that can vary at runtime. For example, think of choosing a route in a GPS app. It could be fastest, shortest, or scenic. Or say, sorting with different criteria, maybe by price, name, or rating. And here mm. is how most of us start. A giant if-else block with sorting logic crammed inside. You add one more condition and the class keeps growing and growing and growing. This violates the open close principle because our code isn't open for extension. It's open for modification. Not good. By the way, if you're wondering what's an open close principle is, it's one of the solid principles, which I've explained in detail in this video previously. Now, the strategy pattern solves this by encapsulating each algorithm in its own class and making them interchangeable. So here at the top, you have a strategy interface. It could be a sort strategy with a method like sort list of product. Below it, you create different concrete implementations. Sort by price, sort by name, sort by rating. The context class may be a product sorter, just holds a reference to a sort strategy. When it needs to sort, it simply calls strategy.sort of products. No conditionals, no repeated logic. Now, if you want to add a new sort method like sort by discount, you just create a new class. You don't need to touch any existing code. That's clean, maintainable, and testable. So that's the big picture. Each algorithm lives in its own class and the context just calls whatever strategy is currently active. Let me show you how this looks in Java with a credit card example, step by step. So you can actually use it in your own project. Here, we start with a payment strategy interface. It defines a pay method. And here are two implementations, credit card payment and PayPal payment. Each one handles payment differently. The payment context uses a payment strategy and it delegates the payment logic to whichever strategy was injected. So in the main method here, we swap strategies at runtime. First credit card, then PayPal, without changing the logic inside payment context. Think of the strategy pattern like plugging different SIM cards into the same phone. The phone is your context. Each SIM, whether Verizon, T-Mobile, Airtel, is a different strategy. You don't change the phone, just the SIM. And the behavior changes automatically. So far, you have seen how to use the factory method to decouple object creation, implement the observer pattern to build reactive systems, and apply the strategy pattern to swap out behaviors on the fly. And these three alone can make your code base cleaner, more modular, and much easier to maintain. But this is just the beginning. There are more powerful patterns worth exploring like decorator, command, adapter, and more. So if you found this video helpful and want me to continue this series, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear which pattern you'd like me to cover next. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe so you don't miss the next deep dive.